welcome to part two of our tutorial video on early medieval brooches. In our previous video, we discussed early Anglo-Saxon brooches from the earliest early medieval period. In this video, we'll move on to the Middle and Late Anglo-Saxon brooches, as well as the Scandinavian and Anglo-Scandinavian brooches from the Middle and Late Early Medieval period. You'll remember this chart from the previous video. It shows a breakdown of brooches by sub-period. As you can see, there are far fewer middle and late early medieval brooches, partly because brooches stop being deposited in graves. This also means that we have far less dating evidence. On the plus side, middle and later early medieval brooches have been very well studied. The Anglo-Saxon brooches by Rosie Reach in 2013 and the Anglo-Scandinavian brooches by Jane Kershaw in 2010. In this video, We'll take the middle and late subperiods together and split them in the same way that Weech and Kershaw do. So first we'll look at the culturally Anglo-Saxon items studied by Weech and then we'll move on to the culturally Scandinavian brooches studied by Kershaw. Chronologically, we're talking about the period from about AD 700 to 850 for the middle early medieval brooches and around AD 850 to 1066 for the late early medieval brooches. So let's start with the Anglo-Saxon brooches of the 8th to 11th centuries. Rosie Reach calls them non-Scandinavian brooches, which is a better term as we may have some continental brooches lurking in there too. 20 or 30 years ago, before the PAS, we'd have identified virtually all of them as continental often called Carolingian because at this point Charlemagne and his family were ruling France. This is because we had so few English finds. Now we tend to think of nearly all of them as Anglo-Saxon too, or in some cases instead. Weech's PhD is the best reference source for these brooches. It's available on Ethos and has a great big illustrated catalogue and lots of lists of brooches. It's very easy to use to find a parallel. All of the types have easy to use numbers, Roman numerals for the bow brooches and Arabic for the other shapes. Let's start with the bow brooches. Middle and late early medieval bow brooches have a variety of names. They can be called ansates, which means handle-like, or some people call them caterpillar brooches. In German, they're known as gleichharmige Bugelfibben, which means equal-armed bow brooches. On the PAS database, they're known as ansates, as this word is not used for anything else. Like the earlier bow brooches, they are again in three parts, two terminals linked by a bow. The terminals are of identical size and shape, but one, the head, has the pin attachments on the reverse, so one or two pin lugs, and the other, the foot, has the catch plate on the reverse. They are small, only about 30 to 50 millimetres long. Ansate brooches are almost always made from copper alloy. We have one silver example and one lead example on the PAS database as well. There are lots of different types of ansate brooches and there have been several studies of them. Two of the most famous are in German, those by Hubener and Thorler. Until the PAS came along, ansates in the UK were so rare that people thought they were a continental type and so some old records might call them a French or Frankish or Merovingian type. Now we've got about 350 records on the PAS database, so we're pretty sure that they must have been made in England. You can see the distribution of them here on the left. Our dating though is different to the dating on the continent. Ansate brooches are found in graves in places like Italy, France, the Netherlands and Germany, but none has ever been found in a grave in England. So we think that they must have been introduced to England after about 700 AD, when furnished burial stops, whereas they were definitely in use on the continent before this, in the 7th or even the 6th century. Ansate brooches appear to come to England probably quite early in the 8th century, so around 700 AD is a perfectly good start date for plenty of them, and some types are still in use in the late 10th century. So some types will need a sub-period of middle, others will need middle to late. As to types, 
which follows Thorless typology, with 12 types defined by their shape, with a final type 13 catch-all for other shapes. All of the types have been found in England apart from type 3, which is too early. Now, what to do if you're faced with fragments, as of course you normally are? Well, one way of telling an ansate brooch from an early Anglo-Saxon bow brooch can be the pin fixings. The pin fixing arrangements of ansate brooches are far more variable than those of early Anglo-Saxon brooches. The pin lug is now most commonly a double lug in line with the pin. In the early period it was normally single. But there are now several other variants. The pin lug can also now be set across the line of the pin, perpendicular to it, which is never found in the early part of the period. And the catch plate can also be set transversely in the same way. Here are some diagrams of three of the varieties possible, with photos from the PAS below. So we have the double pin lug with longitudinal catch plate, everything parallel to the pin on the left. In the middle, a single transverse pin lug and longitudinal catch plate. And on the right, both transverse. As you can see, a transverse catch plate has a slot cut to form the catch rather than being bent over. What we have is three possibilities for the pin lug, single and double, both parallel to the pin and transverse, and two possibilities for the catch plate, parallel to the pin and transverse. Here are all the variants. Interestingly, it's been very difficult to find those with the standard single pin lug in line with the pin, which is the absolute standard for the early Anglo-Saxon period. The one with the blank box, we haven't yet been able to find an example with inline lug and transverse catch plate. Lastly, we have a seventh type. This one here is a rather crudely made ansate cut out of a strip and it isn't cast. The pin fixings can't be cast in one piece and have to be added separately. This can be done by rivets, as shown here, or soldering. Incidentally, this type is definitely English. It's not yet been found on the continent. This graph uses numbers from Rosie Reach's thesis to give you a quick idea of the commonest types of ansate brooch. By far the most common are the type 2, with circular terminals, and the type 10, D-shaped in cross-section usually, with these transverse mouldings. Then the type 12, which has trefoil terminals. Then the type 11, which is a wide flattish strip. These four types represent nearly 80% of all the ansate brooches. The ansate is the only type of bow brooch in the middle and later early medieval period, so now we'll move on to the circular brooches. We'll start with the commonest, the one decorated with a back-turned animal. Rosie Reach has divided these into four subclasses, which you can look up in her thesis. We're not sure what this animal is. It could be a lion or a horse, as it has a mane. However, horses have hooves, whereas this animal has toes, so on balance, lion seems more likely. How many Anglo-Saxon craftsmen had actually seen a lion after all? It's incredibly standardised wherever it's found throughout the country almost always facing left, looking back over the body towards the upright tail, with this pelleted border and often these ring and dot motifs added. Their date comes from three found in 10th century contexts at Coppergate in York. There are no other good archaeological contexts and we can't do much with the art history. It's stretching a bit to call it art at all. There are hundreds of these known, but they seem at present to be restricted largely to East Anglia and Lincolnshire as you can see from this map from Reach's thesis. Staying with disc brooches, now let's move on to brooches made from coins, or made to imitate coins. There is some disagreement about terminology here. On the PS database, we call brooches made from coins, like these, coin brooches, and brooches that have designs based on coins, numular brooches. The word numular means coin-like. However, Rosie Reach uses numula to mean brooches actually made out of coins, and pseudo-numula to mean brooches with designs based on coins. So just bear this in mind when looking at and creating records for this brooch type. 
We'll start off with those brooches actually made from coins. First, a quick reminder that as they are made from silver coins but have now become brooches, they qualify as treasure, so remember to report them if you find one. We don't have many of these on the database. Those we do have start in the 10th century, get more and more popular into the late 11th century, but after that they become less common again. Coin brooches can be fairly easy to date as we always know the date of manufacture of the coin. Most of the coins used are of Edward the Confessor or William I. You can see here how four rivet holes can be used to attach a hinged pin and a catch plate. So a series of holes in a coin and one or both faces being gilded are good evidence that a coin has been turned into a brooch. Now we turn to brooches made in imitation of coins, which we call numula. Rosy Reach is quite hard line as to whether an object can be said to have been made in imitation of a coin. She says that we should only assume this when a bust or legend derivative can be identified, because so many disc brooches look a little bit like coins. This is a very good idea, so these examples here are numula brooches because they are very heavily based on coins. But in the past we've been a little too ready to label other disc brooches as numula, so you might find this term used a bit loosely on early records. It's surprisingly hard to date most numula brooches. Some are identifiably based on coins of Louis the Pious early 9th century, others are based on prototypes of the 11th century. We feel that they are not easy to identify as to prototype and it's always a good idea to ask a numismatist, so please ask your finds liaison officer for advice when you're recording one of these brooches. Incidentally, it's strange that the numulas are imitating early 9th century coins of Louis the Pious, but you never find a real coin brooch that's this early. In terms of materials, numulas are either lead or copper alloy, with possibly a few more lead examples than copper alloy. You'll notice that many of them tend to have these concentric rings of pellets, and these also occur on other brooches. It's a common thread that binds them all together, and you'll see it on many other types of middle and late Anglo-Saxon disc brooch, such as those shown here. These are Weech types 3, 4 and 5, which don't have particularly good common names. So when recording, add the Weech types to the subclassification and leave the classification field blank. It's the Weech types that are crucial. Type 4 is quite a big group and it's defined as being based on crosses. This means that some of them are very close to numula brooches, as plenty of early medieval coins have cross designs on their reverses. Others though are a pretty long way from any coin design and instead look much more like other jewellery such as strap ends and hooked tags, with panels of decoration separated by ladder pattern. Rosy Reach suggests a 10th century date for most of these, but we think from the art historical parallels that at least those with the curved arms, the four C's, could start in the 9th century. Now we're going to move away from the flat discs, but stay with circular brooches. We'll start with the disc that has a narrow, lowered border around the edge. Another way of putting this is that the brooch steps up to a wide flat topped boss in the centre. These can have a variety of motifs on the boss. So here we have C scrolls on the left, probably the most common type, and a cross on the right. These have been dated by Rosie Reach to the 11th century and they are her type 13 brooches. The next type, type 15, actually ties together two kinds of brooches which had previously been separate. The first has been known for years as the cogwheel brooch and so we keep this in the classification field and we add weech type 15A to the subclassification field. These brooches are incredibly standardised, always having 18 little knobs sticking out around the edge. You can see that the decoration is based on four C-shaped scrolls forming a cross, with a lozenge-shaped centre which is slightly hollowed on the reverse. Some people have seen these pairs of bosses at the end of each of the cross arms as rudimentary animal or human heads. Then there's the type 15B, the openwork cross, much the same size as the cogwheels and occasionally with groove decoration and a central dot. 
these don't have the lozenge form boss in the centre. Fragments of these can be hard to spot, so here are some examples. They can be a bit like the end of an openwork 10th century strap end, but the pin fixings on the reverse give it away as a brooch. Both the cogwheels and the openwork discs seem at present to be confined largely to East Anglia, but it's worth looking out for them elsewhere. They seem to be essentially 9th century. You can see from this graph that the six commonest types of circular brooch together cover 80% of all of these brooches. So that covers the basic circular brooches, so now we'll move on to the enamelled ones. Enamelling is done in two techniques, champlevé and cloisonné. Champlevé means raised field, and these have cells sunk into the thickness of the metal, usually cast quite shallow hollows ready to be filled with enamel, and they're generally small and cheap. The cloisonné ones have separately soldered on cell walls, and are a whole different ball game in terms of craftsmanship and probably social class. Rosie Weech classifies them by motif, and she has three common types, cross, saint and flower or star patterns. The first is almost always champlevé, the second is usually cloisonné, the third is always cloisonné. Here are some examples of type 18 decorated with a cross. These are champlevé, so with the cells for the enamel cast as hollows. The enamel doesn't tend to survive well. These brooches are common in Germany and the Netherlands. They seem to be the most common brooch on the Dutch database PAN, for example. But it's hard to imagine that they weren't made here too. They date to the 9th century generally, like the openwork crosses and the cogwheels of type 15. Type 19 is much less common and is the type decorated with a facing bust. These are called Heiligen Fibeln in German, which translates to Saint Brooch in English. These come in both the Champlevé form, shown above, and the Cloisonné, shown below. The reason that they're supposed to be saints rather than just people is that there's a ring around the head. You can call this a nimbus or a halo in your object description. They date to the late 9th and early 10th century. By far the most common type of cloisonné enamelled brooch is this kind, generally with flower or star patterns made by soldering cell walls to a disc, which is then put into the centre of the brooch. All the surfaces are then gilded. It comes in two main variants, with lobes or knots around the edge and without lobes. These have in the past been called the Saunderton type and the Colchester type after good examples of early finds, but it's better to use the which type number when recording them, not least to avoid confusion with the Colchester type Iron Age and Roman brooches. So put cloisonné enamelled in the classification field and the which type number in the subclassification field. They basically appear to date to the 11th century or late 10th to early 12th century. This is slightly odd because the saint brooches made using the same technique appear to stop in the early 10th century. So at present, there seems to be a bit of a gap between these two types. Here's a selection of type 20A with lobes. You can see there's quite a variety of patterns in the cloisonné disc. Don't forget that the brooch can come apart and the cloisonné disc can be found on its own. So the lobes will disappear, like the example on the right, but you can tell this is an incomplete brooch, not a brooch without lobes, because there will not be any pin fixings on the back. And here are some of the ones that don't have the lobes, the type 20 Bs. They have this distinctive ribbed or beaded border, which isn't found on the type 20 As. So even if the lobes have broken away, it's reasonably easy to distinguish the types. The ones with the lobes are very much more common than the ones without. Note that the example in the top right of the image has a backplate with the pin fixings attached to the beaded frame. So a detached cloisonné disc type of 
type 20b would not be any different to a detached cloisonné disc of type 20a. There are a few more enamel types, but these are the main ones. Now we'll move on to brooches of other shapes. We'll start off with cross-shaped brooches, and by far the most common of these will look rather familiar to you. Essentially, it's a cogwheel brooch, but without the outer toothed edge. It has the lozenge in the centre and the grooves and scrolls. Like the cogwheels, these are again quite strongly concentrated in East Anglia, and they're very standardised. Then there are several other kinds. This one is also cross-shaped, but is made in one piece. And keep this in mind for a minute because we'll see it again. And these others are also cross-shaped, but again different. Incidentally, do not call these cruciform. Weech's next group is much more varied. They are rectangular brooches, and they seem to have been used throughout the Middle and Late Anglo-Saxon periods, from at least the late 8th century to the 11th. The commonest form has incurved long sides, as you can see here, and occasional other kinds, including this one at the bottom, which is arguably closer to one of the Champlevé enamel disc brooches. Rather different are these bird-shaped brooches. English bird brooches come in two types, both with the bird seen in profile. The earliest is the one with the cross on its back. They can be made in silver, gilded and with niello inlay, as on the left, or more cheaply and amateurishly in copper alloy, as on the right. Generally, the cross meets the back of the head, but not always. And the feet are together at the bottom to form a loop. Some people think these are doves, as the most popular Christian bird. They do have a small head with downcurved beak and a big puffy breast, so that's probably correct. Note that these look both left and right. They appear from better dated continental parallels to date to the late 8th and early 9th century. The other type of bird brooch is more mysterious. It has a crest, which may indicate that it's supposed to be a cockerel or maybe a peacock. Things to note are the triangular tail and the bar between body and tail, and the engraving which you can see most clearly at the bottom. Also, the three projections on the head fo forming the comb or crest, and the wing normally raised above the body. These three are all looking right, and maybe they all did. The dating of these is tricky. At present, they're dated to the 11th century by analogy to similar brooches which don't have the distinctive cones or crest and which are mainly found in Denmark. It's been suggested by Pedersen that the movement of the fashion may have had something to do with Knut's conquest of England. Rosie includes them with her corpus on the grounds that this particular type with the crest is definitely English and isn't found in Scandinavia and wasn't included in Kershaw 2010. It's very borderline, and we'll come back to these bird brooches later when we look at the Scandinavian brooches. Now these bird brooches are really the closest that we've come to anything that might be called art on a brooch. This isn't really a true picture because there are some fabulous brooches with art on them, but never very many. We'll show you a few now, and we're gonna look at them in chronological order starting back in the 8th century. If we go back a little further to these very rare and flimsy one-piece 7th century brooches, the safety pin brooches, these seem to have been designed to be seen flat against the body from the side. Early in the 8th century, they seem to have been turned back in the conventional direction, pin inwards, to create what's known as the strip brooch, which type 31. These are typically made in one piece and the strip can get quite wide to give room for decoration. The most elaborate versions of Weech Type 31 are perhaps these lozengiform ones, and here we can see what's known as the Mercian art style. It has these long thin lines turned into geometric knots, sometimes with animals, but always rather thin and thready, rather like the art on the Lindisfarne Gospels. Parallels from manuscripts means that we can date this art to the 8th century. You can see here, 
left top and bottom, that the ornament is made in the chip carved style, so with wide V-shaped grooves, and where the grooves intersect, pyramid shaped indentations. If you look here, top right and bottom right, you can see something very characteristic of Middle Anglo-Saxon jewellery, pins and brooches, which is a separate pin riveted on. So sometimes you see no pin fixings but a hole, as here, and it can be difficult to tell a large pin head from a small brooch. There are also a few brooches that are constructed in exactly the same way, but are circular. You can see that these ones here are made in exactly the same way as the narrow strips and most of the lozenge form strip brooches, that is, in one piece. The CAM one is a recent find, and the WMID one was originally recorded as a pendant. The next type, Reach Type 12, is defined as disc brooches with Mercian style art. Mercian style animals are tall giraffe-like creatures, like the one shown on the Flixborough example, often with these dotted or speckled bodies, but they're quite fleshy compared to the very slim thready interlace which is all tangled up around them in a more or less geometric way. There are often sharp angles in the interlace. The two brooches on the right only have interlace, no animals. This isn't unusual at the lower end of the market, so just look for the style of the interlace. These wide strips dividing it into panels are characteristic too, often emphasised with a line of dots. You'll also see that these have holes for a separate pin fixing. Now the tricky thing about these is very occasionally the form of the brooches can be imitated in other things, like the with them linked pins shown at the bottom here. So do remember that if something isn't right, so for example you don't have the right number of rivet holes, then pins are an alternative identification, albeit a very rare alternative. Now have a look at these brooches. They don't have Mercian style ornament on them, they have the next common art style, the Trewiddle style, which is broadly 9th century. These are Weech's type 11. They are generally very smart, made from silver and rather uncommon. These have separate pins. We've also put a nice example of a Trewiddle style animal here. They have rounded bodies again, often with lines or nicks on them often really lively faces, and the interlace is much more rounded and chaotic, like plant tendrils. You can also get these in the one-piece shape. We don't have any good examples on the PAS database at present, so you can see how rare they are. The one illustrated here is from the British Museum collections. At the bottom is also a picture of a strap end from the late 9th century Truiddle hoard, which gave its name to the art style. This shows you another good example of an animal with these double nicks, a big round eye, squared off snout and upright ear, and a generally perky or even rather startled expression. Do bear in mind that the Mercian and the Truiddle style are not the only art styles in use in the 8th and 9th century, there's a whole spectrum in between. Next we have Weech Type 16. You often find less easily recognisable or datable art on this style of brooch. These are like the circular brooches but are essentially a cross shape with curved ends to the cross arms which meet or nearly meet. They are called Elmset type brooches because of a famous example found in the Suffolk village of Elmset. Most have a separately riveted on pin but the one in the middle is made in one piece. The art suggests a date from the second half of the 8th century, with this one at the top, through to the end of the 9th with Trewiddle style decoration on the beast and tor brooch in the bottom left. It's a bit of a mystery why the Trewiddle style, which is so common on strap ends, is not found on many brooches. There are still less than 20 Trewiddle style brooches known. This slide emphasises that point. On the left are the brooches with Truiddle style, and on the right are the strap ends. You need to know when looking at this slide how many brooches of all types there are at this time compared to strap ends. There are about a thousand middle or late early med brooches and about two thousand strap ends. 
So for some reason, Truidal style is found on lots and lots of strap ends, but on hardly any brooches. As the 9th century ends and the 10th century begins, the main Anglo-Saxon art style shifts to the Winchester style, which is based much more on plants and birds. It's more like continental or Mediterranean art, and you basically don't find it on brooches. It was originally defined from line drawings and manuscript paintings, like the one pictured here on the left, with the fluttery fabrics and symmetrical plant ornament that is characteristic. On the right here are a few objects with birds in vegetation and symmetrical animals. Generally, the Winchester style on objects is just symmetrical tendrils though, as shown here. This slide shows again how few brooches there are with Winchester style and how many strap ends there are. There are so few Winchester style brooches that they don't make a type up on their own. Now we're going to move on to the Scandinavian style objects. For us to be able to recognise these brooches, they have to have recognisable Scandinavian style art on them, whether fully Scandinavian or a sort of hybrid Anglo-Scandinavian in style. At the same time as Rosie Reach was doing her PhD, Jane Kershaw was toiling away on the Scandinavian style material and produced her PhD in 2010. She then published an edited version as a book in 2013. As before, we're not going to go through in strict chronological order, but we'll start with the commonest brooches and work onwards from there. By far the commonest brooches of Scandinavian or Anglo-Scandinavian style are these ones. They used to be called the lozenge and knots brooch, but there now are so many brooches whose names use the word lozenge that Jane renamed them, and they are now called the East Anglian series. Nearly half of all Kershaw's brooches are of this single type, and they are not all found in East Anglia. In fact, the distribution is pretty similar to any other kind of late early medieval brooch. They are flat disc brooches, generally very close to 30mm in diameter, decorated with a very standardised motif. This lozenge with a circular hole in the centre, with each corner extended into a double strand, which then curls around clockwise and loosely knots before ending in a blob at the end. You can see from this slide that the pin arrangements are variable. All of these have a pin lug which is parallel to the edge and perpendicular to the pin, but the catch plate can be set either along the line of the pin and bent over, or perpendicular to it and with a slot cut. It's very important to describe the pin arrangements on whatever brooch you have. These pin arrangements are more Anglo-Saxon than Scandinavian and we'll go into more detail on this in a little while. Because they are also standardised, there isn't much to say about them apart from noting the flat shape. This is again more Anglo-Saxon than Anglo-Scandinavian and the double strand knot ornament, which is derived from the Bora style, which is the main art style of the late 9th to 10th century in the Scandinavian world. It's named from art on harness mounts found in a ship burial at Bora in Norway. These brooches do tend to get very worn, but even with hardly any ornament left, they are still pretty recognisable. They are all, as far as we know, of copper alloy, and where they have been analysed, they show very low levels of zinc. Zinc does tend to be found in brooches in Scandinavia. The date for these centres on the 10th century, but there are hints that their production may continue into the 11th. The next type we'll look at is a kind of counterpart to the previous one, but is properly Scandinavian. It's smaller and domed, which is characteristic of Scandinavian brooches, and is much more likely to have pin arrangements that are common in Scandinavia. Plus, there are loads of them found in Scandinavia, mainly in Sweden and Denmark. Here on the left, we have the double pin lug and longitudinal catch plate, but also a third fixing here, a loop, which is conventionally shown at the bottom of the image. This loop seems to have been used to suspend things from, either a necklace or chains ending in something. But the two on the right have the more Anglo-Saxon transverse pin lug and longitudinal curled over catch plate. These animal heads, with triangular faces that look a bit like cats with rounded ears, or perhaps teddy bears, 
are characteristic of the Borra style, and so are these double strand loops that are bound by these short lengths. For the Borra style, you're looking for alert little faces looking straight at you with round eyes and rounded ears and neat, often symmetrical, geometric, sometimes closed rings of interlace. We use the name Janssen's Type 2 to record these after the person who catalogued the brooches from the Burka site. The brooch pictured here is the commonest type and is called Janssen's Type 2A. There are also some rather uncommon variants which still have the three animal heads but which are slightly different. But they are all Janssen's Type 2. Another kind of disc brooch with Bora style decoration is this one. The thing to note here is this loop, which is C-shaped. These loops can have their ends towards the middle of the circle or their backs. They aren't always that easy to see. There's a whole set of different designs as demonstrated by these drawings taken from Kershaw's thesis. Jane Kershaw also calls these designs Terslev style, from brooches found in a silver hoard at Terslev in Denmark. You can see that they vary in how flat or domed they are, mostly slightly domed, and that there is again a variety of pin arrangements, so be careful to describe them well. Kershaw dates them to the 10th century. Now the final disc brooches we're going to look at are those with yelling style animals on them, known as Janssen's Type 1. Again, we're going to be looking at small, slightly domed brooches that are incredibly worn with difficult to decode art. The yelling style is named from art on a silver cup from the site of yelling in Denmark, but for some reason we write it with an extra E on it in England. You'll remember that the Borra style animals look straight out at you, while the yelling style animals are all in profile. The first kind is Janssen's Type 1D. It has a single animal on it, turned backwards and looking to the left, with the body forming a kind of reversed S shape. The tongue comes out of the mouth and goes over the body and under the rear leg. The body has transverse ribbing across it, with a line to either side. Usually these brooches are rather worn, so it can be difficult to make the animals out. This type has a very consistent motif, but as we now expect several different pin arrangements, transverse pin lug, double longitudinal pin lug and suspension loop, and as you can see, both lead and copper alloy. This next type is Janssen's Type 1E. It's not very common with only about four examples on the database at present, but it is lovely to look at this art. The two identical S-shaped animals are biting their tails and each gripping a neck and a leg. The gripping feet or hands are really old Scandinavian style motif, found right back to the 8th century, but the wiggly sinuous animal in profile is a new thing. This brooch is domed and has the Scandinavian style double pin lug and suspension loop. Staying with the yelling style, we can move on to some made in a much more sophisticated way, and these are the Janssen Type 1As. When complete, these have an openwork domed front and a solid riveted on back, both do not always survive. The animal has a much more spiral form. A characteristic part of the yelling style is that it has this element which comes out of the back of the head. It's normally a curl or kind of ponytail below the ear, and it's called a lappet. Now we're going to move on to brooches of other shapes, not circular. The commonest of these is the trefoil brooch. These have an interesting history. They were inspired by Carolingian mounts, like the ones pictured here, and similar strap distributors with Carolingian acanthus-style art, plant stems and leaves. This is the sort of thing that also develops into the Winchester style. These come into the possession of early Vikings, and then the idea is taken up by brooch makers. 
There are a few very smart trefoil brooches on the database, like the two pictured here. Although we should say that the bottom example is missing any pin fittings, so it's not definite that it is actually a brooch. Much more common are these, where the acanthus leaves have been converted to this kind of geometric leaf ornament. By far the largest number of trefoil brooches have this kind of very standardised ornament on them. Annoyingly, they tend to break into several pieces, and not all of these have pin fixings on the reverse. You can see the double pin lug here and the transverse catch plate, and both fixings here are transverse, so again a little bit of variety. Here are some fragments with various styles of decoration. On the left you'll recognise the geometric style, and obviously the one below has pin fixing, so it's definitely a brooch. The two on the right, it's less certain. It's important to put trefoil in the classification field, not just in the description field, as there will be a lot of other early medieval brooches which use the word trefoil. Notably small longs and Janssen's type 2A brooches with the three borer style heads. One potential problem with fragments of trefoil brooches is distinguishing them from strap ends of Thomas's class E, the kind with parallel sides and a rounded end, shown here. But actually it's not a very common problem, because most trefoil brooches have the geometric decoration we've discussed, whereas most class E strap ends fall into these specific types shown here. So 90% of the time you'll be able to use the decoration to decide on the object type, even if you only have a fragment. These examples shown here have posed a problem in the past, but in practice hard cases are pretty rare. Most of them are going to be strap ends, because strap ends are far more common than trefoil brooches. All of these pictured here are perhaps more likely to be strap ends, but the possibility of trefoil brooches should perhaps be mentioned. But generally, don't go for the trefoil brooch unless you can find a decent parallel. Moving on now to openwork lozenge brooches. Essentially, they are made up of four little borer-style animal heads, looking outwards, with slender necks passing under these strands to make a cross in the centre. Not many are as nice as the ones shown here, though. Most are a bit more crude, such as those pictured here. This slide also shows the variety of pin fixings again, so make sure you describe them fully. It's essential to use the words openwork lozenge and not just lozenge for these ones, as there are so many forms of lozenge brooch. Lastly, we're going to go back to the bird brooches again, which you'll hopefully remember as which type 30A, and which we said was only found in England, but was based on Scandinavian examples. Well, here are some examples of the pure Scandinavian type, although these ones were all found in England. There are lots of these from Denmark, over 70 examples in fact. Some of them have Ringerica style engraved elements, such as the spiral shoulder. Anne Pedersen has studied this group quite thoroughly and given them a date of around 1050 to 1150 in Scandinavia. This seems quite late for English finds, and it's possible that they were invented earlier in England, but if this is the case, then it would be an unusual example of cultural transfer the other way. It's rare for English fashions to catch on in Denmark. Anyhow, this has brought us up to the mid-11th century, if not a bit later, and therefore the end of the early medieval period. By way of completeness, there's also the classic Viking Age brooch, the oval brooch, which is sometimes called the tortoise brooch, there are so few of them known from England, and it's unlikely you'll come across them. There are just three examples on the database at present. So why don't we have them here? It's been argued that oval brooches are less common in Denmark by the time the Danes are coming over here to settle. But this can't be the whole answer, as they are still being found throughout the 10th century in Denmark, just in slightly lower numbers. 
Other people have pointed out that they also tend to break into lots of pieces, but this is hardly unusual for early medieval brooches, so they are likely to be really rare, not often worn by Vikings in England, and that's interesting and worth researching. Admittedly, oval is not a particularly easy word to search for on the database, and it really needs to be in the classification field if it's going to be found. This brings us to the end of our Early Medieval Brooches tutorial. For further guidance, please check out our uh, Recording Guide to Brooches, which you can find on the County Pages section of our website. The link is in the description.